1967 was a year of world-shifting events in the United States and abroad. Elvis Presley finally got married. The first national professional football championship game was held and Green Bay won. Race riots claimed lives from Newark to Detroit. Students across the country protested the increasingly bloody war in Vietnam, yet by the end of the year there would be 474,300 American soldiers in Vietnam. And in May, in the small town of Decorah, Iowa, members of Luther College's Nordic Choir and their conductor, Weston Noble, were packing their bags for a six-week tour that would take them to West Germany, Norway, and then behind the Iron Curtain to East Germany. This was to be the choir's first international tour, and when it was announced in 1964, Luther President Dr. Elwin Farwell observed there was rejoicing across the campus. Both current and prospective Luther College students were excited about the possibility of joining the choir and going on tour. Well, years ago, it was possible to be a Nordic even as a freshman, and so there were, uh, there were some of us that made it in our freshman year, and, and um, of course, by the time we were sophomores, this was such an exciting thing to go to go to Europe, I mean, that was like just a dream that we had had, you know, and we wouldn't probably ever have gone uh, except for the tour. Since transporting over 100 people along with musical instruments, choir robes, and luggage for six weeks was a complicated business, Luther sought assistance from other sources. Johann Hambro, a journalist and secretary general of Nurmans Furbina, would be the key contact in Norway. In January 1965, President Farwell sought Hombro's advice about the sensitive question of what name the choir should use in Norway. It had only been 20 years since the end of World War II, and there was concern about the name Nordic Choir. Would the name bring to mind the Nazis' all-too-recent master race theories? President Farwell wrote, about three years ago, the title Nordic Cathedral Choir was discontinued in publicity because there was some feeling that the word Nordic had negative connotations among Norwegians. Is the word Nordic offensive to the Norwegian people because of its use by the Nazis? Or is it recognized that the Nazis had no right to use the word as they did and that it is perfectly proper in describing the Scandinavian people? Certainly, we would not want to use a name that would be in any way offensive. If this is true, we shall adopt another name for the choir that may be used for publicity purposes. Hombro quickly replied that he found the name unfortunate, not because the word has any particular negative connotation, but rather because Nordic Cathedral Choir simply does not sound right to us. I believe the Cathedral Choir is both dignified and impressive, and it would sound very good to Norwegian ears. Eventually, in all Norwegian publications, the group would be referred to as the Luther College Choir. After the question of the name was settled, the next item to tackle was what to wear. In order to reduce the amount of luggage, the choir decided to adopt a uniform of sorts. Men were sent to Minneapolis to be fitted for a sports jacket, trousers, and tie. The women selected the material for an outfit that many sewed themselves. Although the look was unified, opinions about it were not. There was quite some discrepancy on the outfits. I love them. Boring. I mean, even looking back, I, I mean, I look back sometimes in those days and you see the, the sport jacket and you kind of go, hey, nice. It's like, oh. There were days when we really didn't want to wear our uniforms, but 
we, we had to, but then we would say in, on the bus, okay, what color of shelt should we wear tomorrow? <laughs> White or yellow? <laughs> so we'd have a little vote maybe. But we all had a good time talking about it. And, you know, it really did add a unification to the group. And, and you know, it was formal to wear skirts then and to look nice. And that was very important. It was important to me and it was important for the image of the choir and so on. So I, I really didn't have a big thing with that. It was fine with me. And then there were the economic realities of the trip. The complete cost was $795, a lot of money in 1967. Most students and their families managed to find ways of funding the trip. Some took out loans from the college. Others had to make personal sacrifices. It was difficult because my parents were not, they were not wealthy, we were farmers. So this was a big deal for them to send me over there. I think I was the first person from my town to go to Europe, probably. And especially on a tour, so there was lots of publicity and I was in all the papers and all that sort of thing. But it was difficult, uh, you know, they had to, I don't know if we had to sell a steer or a cow or something to to make the money for it. Some students also received help from a source close to the choir. In the final accounting, next to the names of several students, appeared the notation, Weston will pay. The choir left Decorah on May 29th, one day after the class of 67 graduated and would return on the 4th of July. For many seniors, the tour would be a thrilling last hurrah before starting a new chapter in life but everyone agreed that they were setting out on an exciting adventure, and there was a feeling of giddy anticipation. The journey began with the long bus ride to the East Coast. In order to help the students cover expenses, the choir gave concerts along the way. In the end, students only received $4 each from these extra performances, but it was good practice for the task awaiting them in New York City. The day or two before we had to get on the plane and fly to Europe, uh, it had been planned that we were going to record an album. And one of the places that RCA used was an old ballroom called Webster Hall uh, that had been a big party place for the, the wealthy, like the Rockefellers and so on, back in the heyday of the 20s and so on. So RCA bought it and turned it into a recording studio. But the thing that impressed a lot of us who were choral majors is we knew that that's where the world-famous Robert Shaw Chorale also recorded. The album was recorded in one day in a single grueling session. That evening, the choir headed to Kennedy Airport to start the next leg of the journey. Traveling in such a large group meant the time in the airport vacillated between hectic rushing and long waits. Students recalled entertaining both themselves and surrounding travelers in what would become a Nordic choir tradition. Before getting on the plane when we were at JFK, I think the plane was late, so we were all singing, which is quite an interesting thing in an airport to get that many young people singing who actually sound really good. And people were all around, and, and I think Jim Scatterbo was playing the guitar. Um, and then we got on the plane and off we flew. In 1967, transatlantic commercial jet travel was only eight years old. So flying to Europe on the impressive Lufthansa Boeing 707 was a big deal. For most of us, it was our very, very first time in a jet airplane, too. So um, 
some of us had been in small planes, but never a jet and never a, you know, across the ocean. So it, it um, when it's your first time doing something really grand like that, I, um, I think we just tend to remember more of the details. And I mean, most of us have been there several times since and don't remember those details as much as the first, so. 1967 was a very different time for air travel. The choir casually mingled in the terminal cocktail lounge and the airline offered them free cigarettes. With few security concerns, the choir simply walked out on the tarmac to pose for a photograph before boarding the aircraft. Better mind my brother how you walk on the cross. Your foot might slip in the soldier was. Oh, Satan wears a club for two. If you don't mind, he'll slip on you. Everybody was excited when the plane landed in Frankfurt, though their arrival was not without challenges. The luggage compartments on the two tour buses were too small to transport the boxes of choir robes. The bus drivers were not as well informed as the planners had hoped, and while on a Rhine River cruise, one choir member had difficulty staying with the group. Well, I wasn't lost. Uh, I just didn't know where I was. <laughs> I was perfectly content where I was where I was at, and I had taken German in high school, and I uh, took one year at Luther, and so of course you want to try out your language with the local folks, right? And we we're going down the Rhine, and I was out there on a beautiful sunny day, and engaging in conversation with someone who was speaking German and uh, trying to speak a little English, and I was totally engrossed in the conversation. And, you know, it's kind of like sitting uh, away from a gate in an airport, and uh, they're calling overhead, and you're hearing a lot of conversation, you don't really hear it, and all of a sudden, uh, my plane just left. <laughs> well, I'm on the boat, and I'm uh, talking away, and all of a sudden, where is everybody? <laughs> And little did I know it, but they're sitting, they're driving on the, on the freeway, uh, and I'm still on the boat uh, talking to the person. And then it became apparent that I think I'm not supposed to, where I'm supposed to be. We were going to Cologne. Right. And, and we got off to take the bus at the stop before right. we got there. And when we pulled away, on the buses, somebody said, where's Lord Wagner? <laughs> and the, the, the boat had already gone on. <laughs> so we thought, well, <laughs> we'll just have the finest in Cologne sometime, someplace. Uh, Mr. Noble, I guess, uh, I never found out the full story, but I think he made sure that I wasn't going to be kept for ransom on the boat to pay an additional fare, because I didn't have any money with me at that point. Despite some minor difficulties, Choir members always manage to find a way to have fun. Sometimes, after long hours on the bus, fun meant practical jokes. We were on a long bus ride across Belgium and into Germany and on up to the northern part, close to the Danish border, most of the day on the bus. And that's enough to drive anybody nuts. And weather was beautiful outside, and, and somebody had snuck a couple of cans of shaving cream into the bus, and pretty soon, that stuff is going all over, especially people who, the long bus ride, oh yes, and they fall asleep with their head up against the window, only to wake into this warm, moist feel, and they've got shaving cream on their face. And then, of course, you can't let that, you can't let that alone. You can't let that be, so there has to be retaliation. And pretty soon, two-thirds of the bus is involved in all this stuff. It was hysterical. Like most colleges in the United States at the time, Luther was still operating under en loco parentis. This meant the college had parental authority over students, particularly in enforcing a strict and somewhat puritanical moral code. Even students of legal age were not allowed to drink on campus or when traveling as official representatives of the college. On May 6, 1967, Lane Haugen, Luther's business manager, wrote to Johann Hambro on behalf of the college, We would like to request that no alcoholic beverages be served at any of the student meals. But when they got to Europe, everything changed. 
At the choir's first concert at a church in Cologne, the singers were surprised to find that beer was offered in the church basement. One incident involving alcohol created a bit of a tempest back in the United States. A picture of several choir men drinking in a German beer garden was inadvertently published in the Ottawa, Illinois local paper, and a flurry of letters ensued. Adrian Elliott complained, If this is a sample of the students representing the college, they are certainly not communicating that they belong to Christ and are living for him. Mr. and Mrs. Melvin Bush wrote, we have had many calls from people who are not Lutherans regarding this clipping in our newspaper. They were as shocked as we were that this is going on. It is done, but the stain is still there. Is this what you call good public relations? Dr. Farwell's reply was a masterpiece of diplomatic discretion. I do appreciate your concern and hope you will assist us in rectifying the damage that has been done by such a release. In Germany, it is customary for people to drink wine and beer with their food. In fact, in many places, it is essential to do so, unless you wish to risk the danger of serious intestinal disorders. Students learned other local customs by staying with host families, and the experiences were both a delight and a challenge. Some students were able to practice their German, while others played charades to communicate with their host families. Some students enjoyed foods familiar to them from their own family traditions, while others tried new dishes for the first time. Students formed long-lasting bonds, even after as little as a single overnight stay, and many of the singers continued to correspond with their host families for years to come. At the same time, it became clear that many of their hosts were still experiencing the trauma and loss of having lived through the devastations of World War II. On this little stand, there were three pictures, and in those pictures were three young men with Nazi uniforms on it, and they were his sons. And I wanted to know where they were now and what was going on, and he kept saying, Alles tot. Their, their three children, their three sons, were all killed in World War II. And uh, two of them were buried in the cemetery, and one of them, they never found his body in Russia. But all three of their sons were killed. And that just startled me. The, the price they paid and the pain they experienced in losing their three sons. For Weston Noble, the tour marked his first return to Germany since his service as a tank driver in the war. The choir first began to understand his experience when they toured the Cologne Cathedral. For the choir, the cathedral was simply another beautiful historic church. But for Weston, it was the place where, 22 years before, he had taken shelter from artillery fire. I remember Noble talking with tears in his eyes about sitting in his tank by the, uh, by the, the Cologne Cathedral and using it as, uh, as protection and, and being shot at in this beautiful cathedral. And, and uh, well, remember, that was impressive. Leaving northern Germany and crossing the North Sea brought the choir closer to the college's Norwegian roots. Luther officials had made sure that Norwegians with connections to the college were aware of scheduled performances. One public relations coup led to an official audience for President Farwell with King Olaf V of Norway. Farwell also worked through other college connections to ensure the tour's success. He informed the chairman of the Bardu, Norway Rotary Club, we will travel abroad and will go further north than any previous choir from the United States. In fact, we are to have a concert at Trumse on June 11th. Some choir members appreciated the opportunity to connect or reconnect with friends and relatives in Norway. The, the home that my relatives were in, I got to stay overnight with them. So that was really an experience to, to spend some time with the family. And actually it was extended family because the grandparents were there and, and the parents were there. And then the, they had a son that was about 
four or five years older than me. And so it was nice to just kind of be part of a family again. You know, you travel and you're, you feel kind of disconnected. And that was kind of a different experience because I really felt like I was part of a family again. And it was a kind of a grounding experience for me. Silver jewelry, pewter, wooden carvings, and of course sweaters were just some of the Norwegian gift items that choir members brought home with them. For some soon-to-be-married choir couples, this meant shopping for their weddings, and one choir member went as far as to create her own souvenir. And I remember there was one particular town where everybody was getting Norwegian sweaters, and I got one there also. But I bought yarn for, to make a Norwegian sweater, because I was a knitter. I thought I was a knitter. I wasn't really a knitter, but I knew enough about it. So I bought this yarn, and I bought the pattern, and I got onto the boat, and of course, I opened it up, and the pattern was in Norwegian, so I couldn't. I couldn't figure out how to do it, but I think it was Lane Haugen spoke Norwegian, so he translated the pattern for me. He didn't know anything about knitting, but all he had to do was read it, and then I knew what I was supposed to do. So I got most of it done on the tour, and I was making the Norwegian sweater for my mother. And so I gave it to her, and I said, uh, I finally have your birthday gift done. And she said, oh, this is very nice. Did you get this in Norway? And I said, yes, I made it. She says. You did not. Tell me, come on. I said, yeah, I, I made it. She says, you made this sweater? I said, I knit the sweater. And she couldn't believe me. And she finally went, oh my goodness sakes. After concerts in Oslo and a spectacular train ride to the West Coast, the choir arrived in Trondheim to sing in the 14th century Nidaros Cathedral, burial place of King Olaf II, and the church where Norwegian kings and queens are consecrated and then it was time to head to the far north. After so many one-night stays with host families, the choir was looking forward to unpacking their bags and relaxing on the cruise boat that was to be their home as they traveled along the Norwegian coast for nearly two weeks. But the boat wasn't as luxurious as they had been told. The Brand 7 was just a mangy old skull that, that uh, you know, was about a hundred foot um, well, it almost looked like a fishing boat. I mean, it was a dirty thing, and it just was really a, a bad boat, I thought. I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I was cruising up and down the coast of Norway. I thought it was just great. I didn't pay attention to those things, probably. That part of it was great. <laughs> then the president of the choir kind of produced a little miracle. He said, well, uh, I've heard of living out of a suitcase, but I've never heard about living in a suitcase. My roommate was a fellow by the name of Harold Usgard, 6'5". Uh, and so he and I were bunking together, and we had to leave our door open because Huck couldn't keep his feet in, in the bed. The bed was too short for him, so we slept with our door open so that he could put his feet out in the hall. We had clotheslines downstairs because we had to wash our clothing in the sink. We thought we were getting washing machines and dryers, but we didn't in this, this older boat. So we had, had clotheslines down there. And this is a quote from Wesson. He said, I have been running into things I have never run into before in my life. The Braun 7 was a disappointment, especially since the choir had intentionally delayed their arrival in Norway for the promise they would sail on a new boat. If the cabins were disappointing... The food almost caused a mutiny. One of the things that they served often was fish pudding, which in, in itself is an unappetizing name. <laughs> and uh, just a white fish. They used a very bland fish, but it was sort of a fish loaf, like we'd have a salmon loaf. Uh, but. Uh, they served it so often, and the students just really rebelled. <laughs> so it took a little meeting with the captain to uh, arrange for a more of a change in our produce. <laughs> Nonetheless, the choir tried to make the best of it. They sang in the dining hall, played poker and bridge on the deck, and enjoyed the magnificent scenery surrounding them. Every evening, the choir would sing a concert usually in a church, 
and after everybody returned to the boat, they would set sail for the next scheduled stop. The Braun 7 sailed peacefully through some of the most scenic fjords imaginable, but after a concert in Svolvia in the Lofoten Islands, the boat crossed back to the mainland over the West Fjord, and a storm blew up. We had a storm on the North Sea when we were going up the coast somewhere along the way. And, and uh, the crew had weather reports, so they knew the thing was coming, the storm. And I remember the first signal that it was really going to be a bad one was that they came in and took some ropes and tied down the piano so it wouldn't be rolling around in wherever, whatever room on the boat that that thing was located. And it was indeed really a rough one as far as the storm. We, we, oh man, so many of us were seasick. It was incredible. And I remember <laughs> laying in my bunk, and the bunks were, you know, they seemed about this wide. They were just narrow, and and uh, and mine was a little almost too short for me. So the, you know, the boat would lurch this way, and my feet would touch the bottom of the bunk, and then it lurch the other way, and my head would hit the other end, and and so. <laughs> It was just very uncomfortable. They had everyone go to their bunks. We were uh, yeah, cabins. To the yes. Cabin, except I wonder if Weston will remember. He and I practically crawled out on the deck to watch this storm. There were 30 to 40 foot waves on the North Sea, and I'll never forget it. He and I were out there, and you were angry because I was out there. Yeah. But I figured I was safe with Weston. And that was probably one of my... <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what he could have done. Bad accommodations, terrible food, and seasickness were forgotten when the choir was warmly welcomed at each stop along the Norwegian coast. A visit from an American choir was a novel experience for these far northern towns and villages. In each small town, the arriving choir was usually greeted by the mayor, other city dignitaries, and even a marching band. Everyone would sing the Norwegian national anthem and then parade up the main street to the town hall for a banquet. After one particularly bad spell of bronze seven food, the choir was treated to an especially good meal where the tables were decorated with fruit. Not only did the choir eat every bite of the food they were served, they ate the fruit centerpieces as well. Since the choir had spent so much time at sea and had seen so many seagulls, some singers thought it would be amusing to bring their travels into the concert. It was probably two-thirds of the way through, and it was in Norway again, where I think the choir was kind of getting a little bit bored with night after night after night of concerts, and you, know, you, you hit this spot of going, ah, I'm getting tired of this, you know. And so there was one song, um, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child, um, and there's a, there's a phrase in there, um, I can't remember, it's feel like or soar like an eagle. And so the choir had all decided that instead of an eagle, they were going to say seagull. So it was soar like a seagull, you know, and it was just something that you know, was that something we should have done? Probably not. But most of the people who were listening never really caught it. And even if they had, it probably wouldn't have made any difference to them. Um, and I don't remember exactly all the circumstances around it, but there was, after the concert, um, there was some sort of a special reception for us or something like that. And we realized that our joking around was really not very appropriate for how they were receiving us as guests and how they were honoring us as performers and musicians. And it was, it was a bit sobering, really, to say, okay, don't mess with the concert. <laughs> you can do all kinds of things backstage, you could do all kinds of things before, you can do all kinds of things after, but don't mess with the concert. Despite a few jokes here and there, the choir took the concerts very seriously and worked hard to create music that thrilled their audiences. Some of the audiences, you know, didn't clap. One audience, I don't know where it was, just stood up at the end. You know, it was silent. But, and then it, one of our guides said that um, that's the first time I've ever heard anybody clap in, in this church. Mm -hmm. 
and when they clapped in unison. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it wasn't Written just applause so like we have now, rhythmic. but very absolutely. Yeah. And there were so different styles of applause in different places that we were. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, 50 years later or 47, that we're sitting here oh, having lived our lives as much as we have, even with music as much as mm -hmm. we have, and still thinking the power that that had has impacted our lives. A critic for the Oslo Aftenposten wrote, everything was expressed with an appealingly pure, balanced, and sure choral sound. The Bergen Tidna critic reported that at the end of the choir's performance in the Bergen Cathedral, the audience rose and stood in silence, the highest compliment that a Norwegian audience can pay to a choir. As the choir traveled northward along the coast of Norway, the days lengthened until they had reached Nurkap, land of the midnight sun. The choir visited a community of nomadic Sami people where they were shown traditional clothing, housing, and customs. There is a picture of you riding a reindeer. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> oh, we were having a lot of fun. The students thought that'd be right fun, so. I don't know, they asked me to get on that reindeer, I guess, so I did. <laughs> that was fun. It's fun when, when you can interact with students and they enjoy it and what you're doing and you, you, you know, do, do something that they like to do with you. I like to do, so I always like students. So anything, anything I could do with students and enjoy it, that was good. While in Nurkap, one couple brought back a souvenir. It was up in that area that Carl found this reindeer hide. Uh, yes. Uh, I was showing you, and, and um, he wanted to buy it. It was about $20 or $22. I think it was 20 bucks. And yeah. he had asked me if I would be willing to go halves with him and pay for half of it. And my reply was that only if we ended up living in the same household <laughs> that I would consider <laughs> helping him pay for the reindeer skin. Because other gals were looking for china and silver and all these wonderful things because they knew they were getting married, but we bought a reindeer hunt together, <laughs> so, which we still have. Yeah, we still have it, she whiz. Right. And we're still married. Still living in the same house, too. <laughs> Northern Norway was the part of the country that had suffered most under Nazi occupation, and physical and emotional scars were still evident. Don and some other fellows went, he, they were, he was fascinated by World War II history, which was true for many of us. And, and uh, he and some other guys, and I think Mr. Noble at one time too, would go up to the bunkers that were the German bunkers from World War II, where they looked out over the fjords when they occupied Norway. And they found that the bunkers had dumps, places where they had thrown mm -hmm. their trash. And so they had more fun just going through the dumps, seeing if they could find things from the war. And this is 67, and the war ended in 45. Mm -hmm. you now, when you're 22, we thought that was forever ago. Right. But now I think about, my gosh, that's not terribly long, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's why some of that was still there, you know. So. Mm -hmm. To the students, World War II was a fascinating piece of history. For their audiences, it was still a vivid memory of personal suffering. When the German army retreated from North Norway, they evicted thousands of people from their homes, burning everything in their path and everything left behind. It was not surprising then that Norwegians in that area wanted nothing to do with anything German, and that included hearing the language. Out of respect, the choir removed the German piece, Zinget dem Herren, from the concert program and reinserted it when they returned to Germany. After a final concert in Kristiansand in southern Norway, the choir bid farewell to the Brand Seven and returned to Germany for the most sobering part of their tour. They traveled first to Hamburg and then on to West Berlin via the Autobahn through East Germany. West Berlin was a far cry from the quaint and quiet villages of the far north. It was a big, thriving, modern, and energetic city full of bright lights, loud music, and fun. Western Germany at that time was, or West Berlin in particular at that time, was a very uh, 
hip kind of environment, a, a, a very hip city. And I remember one evening too, we were at some sort of a disco, you know, with the really loud music and the lights and flashing and strobes and all kinds of stuff. And it was like, whoo, I've never been to one of these before. <laughs> in Berlin, the choir sang at the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche in a stunning blue glass sanctuary next to the bombed out tower of the former church which had been preserved as a reminder of the war's devastation. Traveling to East Germany at the height of the Cold War was extremely rare for any American group. Theo Halti Nickel of Valparaiso University suggested the choir participate in a church music seminar in Leipzig to celebrate the 450th anniversary of Luther's Reformation. Visiting East Berlin was one thing, but having a group of young American singers traveling on to places like Leipzig and Wittenberg was almost impossible to imagine at that time. Before crossing over into East Germany, there were complicated logistics to manage. We had to get our photos and anything valuable into envelopes, and we were given stamps and whatnot to send our film to us again once we were outside of uh, East Germany, so we all had the right address of the hotel we were staying at. At Checkpoint Charlie, the choir turned over their passports for inspection and counted and recorded their money, while East German guards searched the buses for contraband and propaganda. West German bus drivers and guides were replaced by East Germans, and during the border crossing process, the choir ran into trouble. We had a manifest for each bus. <clears throat> And the uh, manifest was different than what we had given him, and it was because some guy traded places with another guy so he could be with his girlfriend. They were on two different buses, they wanted to be together. Uh, when the manifest was wrong, that meant that we might be having a problem that we had to solve with the police. So, but we, we got it solved and said, no, it's just a, a, a lover, a lover uh, attempt, you know, at being a lover. Once they cleared Checkpoint Charlie, West Berlin's bright vibrancy was replaced with what most choir members remember as East Berlin's oppressive grayness. I couldn't even envision that I was going to be going to a place like that. It seemed like it was absence of color. Every day was a new experience. Every minute, practically, of the day was a new experience. And there was, it was kind of like being on overload all the time. And it was so hard for me to grasp that here I was over the ocean, and these were, these were people just like me. And yet, they had lived such a different kind of life than I had been blessed with. In West Germany, the choir moved freely and interacted easily with local people. Everything changed in the East. The tour guides announced that the group must stay together and deviations from the officially approved schedule were not permitted. Men in black were spotted tailing members of the group. In Leipzig, someone broke into choir members' rooms and searched through their belongings. One choir member decided to try a bit of amateur spycraft himself. I don't know if you ever heard of the story of The Man from UNCLE, the TV show, that it was kind of a spy show back in the day and I remember one of the tricks that they did on the man from uncle was you put talcum powder on something so if somebody touched it you'd see their fingerprints so I got some talcum powder and put it on like the my closet you know to make sure that if somebody went into my closet I'd know I mean what would I have done but and, and, and then the other thing that I thought was really cool is you take a, a hair and you put spit on both sides of it, so if the door was opened, you know, the hair would fall off. They didn't search my room. I was kind of almost disappointed after all of the, the spy capers that, <laughs> that I had used. There were no diplomatic relations between the U.S. and East Germany, so choir members had been cautioned to guard their passports. But in Leipzig, three passports went missing. I decided to go and have my hair wash, set, whatever, in the, the hotel beauty parlor. And unlike in the United States where you put your head into, you put your head back, 
in Germany, you put your head into the sink. And just as I was putting my head into the sink, I thought about my purse, which was just down on the floor next to me. I thought, I wonder if I need to get that passport out of there. But I thought, ah, it's OK. So anyway, long and short of it is when my head was in the sink, somebody in that beauty salon went into my purse, took the passport. But I didn't know that because it was, it was zipped in a center uh, part of the purse, so I didn't, I didn't check on it. That night, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, there is a knock on the hotel door. And I get up to answer it, open the door, and there's nobody there. But there is lying at my feet in a brown parcel my passport. And that is one of the few times in my life when my heart literally went to my toes. So they took it, um, but I'm very glad that they gave it back. Maybe people from who were, you know, the tour director and organizers made some effort. All I know is that my passport was stolen and returned mysteriously. And I figured that unlike Carol, who also got her passport back, that whoever stole my passport, you know, whatever the maid or whoever and took it to the uh, the secondhand market for passports, what, what are we going to do with this? 250 pound black male who's trying to escape East Germany. <laughs> Not. Because <laughs> <you know? laughs> it left and then it came back. The Cold War significantly affected the planning and conduct of the tour. Before leaving the U.S., Western Noble suggested that choir members bring new Kennedy half dollars to give as gifts to their hosts. These large coins were given away throughout the tour but they had deeper meaning for the East Germans because passing Western money was illegal. The choir was told not to bring any books or magazines into East Germany, but Weston did not always comply. He recalls an encounter with an East German wanting information about the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War that had taken place earlier in June. His question was, who won the war? I remember that. And I, th I said, well, uh, Israel did. I said, well, I've got a Time magazine log. You know, you, would you like to take it and read it? Oh, yes. But he says, now we're going to meet each other uh, and you must not even speak to me. You mustn't even look at me. Despite the ever-present surveillance and restrictions on person-to-person -person contact, the choir and tour leaders made an effort to reach out to the people of East Germany. We were getting ready to leave. I was on this side of the bus and the Farwells were over here. And this little chap got on and, uh, uh, you know, that was exciting. And so I gave my Kennedy half dollar. And he, obviously went home and brought back every single German money that they had because he wanted so badly to go, go with us. And I'll never forget looking at Farwell just crying. And when we left Germany in a sort of a rural spot, but they just decided not to even look at the bus. So we could have taken those people with us. However, who would have taken their responsibility later on, I'm not sure. Although the Reformation Music Festival was the reason for the choir's travel to East Germany, another event held greater significance for both the choir and their audience. While in Leipzig, the choir was to visit J.S. Bach's St. Thomas Kirche. The choir knew that only one performance had been allowed in East Germany, and that had already taken place at the music festival. So they were surprised when they found themselves up in Bach's choir loft and singing what seemed to be a kind of spontaneous mini-concert. But like much of what they experienced in East Germany, what appeared to be one thing turned out to be something quite different. 
letters between Theo Holty Nickel and the St. Thomas Church Council Superintendent, indicate that it was planned well in advance. Church officials may have wanted to keep information about the performance from the East German government to avoid political censorship. The performance was not on the official itinerary approved by the East German government, and the only advertisement would be by word of mouth from the pulpits of Leipzig's churches on the morning of the concert. Despite the lack of forewarning, the church filled, and prominent East German musicians were in attendance as well. The people were crying. The, the one German guard that was, seemed to be kinder than the other was crying. So we moved a lot of people by singing, giving them an opportunity to hear music that was for the glory of God. So it was a, uh, it was a thrilling experience, thrilling experience for, for all of us. It was not until later that the choir learned about the consequences of their performance and the risks that were taken in order to bring their music to the people who came to the church that day. I remember coming out the front door um, afterwards, and it was just like in the movie. Here were three or four black cars with, with men with dark trench coats sitting there taking pictures of everybody that was, uh, that was coming out. And the, I remember the pastor explaining that for East Germans, it was as difficult to go east as it was west. Uh, Russians were very frightened of the East Germans, and so to get out of Germany, it didn't matter what direction, it was very difficult. You had to have a clean slate, and he said, that took care of my clean slate, and he said it was worth it. After visiting Wittenberg and laying a wreath on Martin Luther's tomb in the castle church, the choir was anxious to leave East Germany. When they returned to West Germany, they felt they could actually breathe again. One thing I'll always remember is then traveling back into West Germany and the spontaneous breaking into applause. Yeah. applause. And relief. Started relief. We so we're back. And we didn't even, we didn't really even talk about it that much, but... No, we, I think we were afraid to talk about oh, anything. Yeah, we didn't it, say But anything. it was just a, a the, you know, just a knee-jerk response of everybody, oh, you know, we're, we're safe. We realized, yeah, to be free. We really were aware of what it was to not be yeah. free. Yeah. The Cold War was not the only political issue to impact the tour. Two members of the choir were black. Henry Avery, and Sproul White. In Europe, the attention they received was significantly different than their experiences in the US. Often they were treated as celebrities and asked for autographs because they looked like sports stars. Because of these assumptions, things could sometimes be awkward. So the thing that most uh, tickled me a lot in our performances, whenever we got to the American section and they would see Negro spiritual with solo, tenor solo, and they were always informed people in the audience so they knew where the tenors were, and I start seeing the expectation on their faces, because I stood next to Dave Nordley, who was a pure Norwegian product. Dave may, maybe weighed 100 
30 pounds, soaking wet, with a big shock of black hair. And he had a beautiful voice, and he was the tenor soloist for most of the spirituals. Dave had rhythm, I didn't, but he, we stood right next to each other. And so I, we'd get to that section, and then people would start looking up at that area of it, waiting for me to burst out with, ain't got time to die. And Dave would sing. And I, they would go, huh? <laughs> The Vietnam War was a constant side note for the men of Nordic Choir. In his notification to the choir before it left Decora, Lane Haugen specifically instructed, men traveling with the group should carry the permit for registrant selective service to depart from the United States. You should have received this form from your local selective service board upon making application to leave the country. Resistance to the war was increasing in the U.S., but in Europe, that feeling was even more pronounced. Some choir members found themselves being directly challenged by their European peers, who held very different views about the conflict. When we were at the church, the press was looking to, for a story, obviously. And when they heard that I had met relatives there, um, they, they wanted to talk to me quite a lot. But it turned into from meeting relatives very quickly to the political side of why are we in Vietnam. And very quickly I became a little bit uncomfortable trying to defend what the U.S. was doing over in Vietnam. And um, ironically, I, I found out firsthand about three years later because I went to Vietnam. This was the 60s, and so, um, so we'd walk down the street and there would be Russian soldiers uh, collecting money um, and pictures of American atrocities in Vietnam and collecting money for the victims of those atrocities. And so that was, that was interesting to be the enemy, interesting to be an American in a place where they're talking about American atrocities. And, um, and what, what do we do to help these poor victims of that? Many choir members began to understand how others viewed the world in ways that were different from their own. They were challenged to think differently, and they returned home with an expanded world view. In 1967, international travel was somewhat rare, especially in the Midwest. For those choir members who came from small towns in Iowa, Minnesota, and Illinois, their travels were big news in their hometowns. David Norris had been filing news stories on each member as they traveled. I had as an assignment to take a picture and a story of every single student on that trip and send it to their hometown paper. By the time they got home, they found that they had become local celebrities. Of course, the whole town was pretty much a Norwegian town. So I had taken a lot of slides. So I remember doing slideshows for months after that because they wanted to see what it looked like. And during that time, I was kind of a big cheese in the town because I was really the only one that had done that. The 1967 Nordic Choir European Tour was only six weeks long, but its impact on the lives of the choir members lasted far longer. Shortly after I got back from the tour, I immediately was off to Southeast Asia for Peace Corps, for Peace Corps experience as opposed to Vietnam experience. And that whole time while I was in the Peace Corps, um, that springboard from that European choir tour really was a foundation for me. I listened to our albums and our, I had taped it, you know, many, many times while I was in the Peace Corps. So it was, you know, it was just a, it was a neat experience to be out in the middle of the jungle and listening to your music that you made. While in the Peace Corps, Phil Svano also started up a small choir with his students, singing simple melee and American tunes. Others would use stories from the European tour, like Don Dynas for his work with the ministry. 
for the many who became music educators, seeing the choir develop as an ensemble and community over the course of a tour was extremely important in building their own music programs. When you're traveling with people, you develop a bond, you develop a relationship that you might not have had had you not taken the trip. And, and, and with my choirs now, I, we tour every other year, and when we get back, we're a tighter ensemble, we're happier with each other because we've had the opportunity to have to deal with each other on a bus for six, seven, eight hours a day. I, but I, and I, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to validate what you're saying because I think touring is, is almost a necessary component for being a part of a choral program. Uh, and everyone who is a part of a choir ought to have an opportunity to, to travel like that and make music together. For Carol Berkland, the Europe tour changed the course of her life completely. You know, I think back, um, there are times in your life when you make decisions and you can see later that if you decided to do one thing or you decided to do another thing, it would have a major impact on who you became as a person. And for me, the, the 67 choir tour was just fundamental because uh, I came home then after that, that summer and realized that what I wanted to do with my life is I wanted to see more of the world and I wanted to figure out uh, how I could get someone to pay me to do that and that of course became the Lutheran Church. So yes it was, I'm convinced that the life that I have had which has been frankly a very interesting and a very full one would not have, would not have happened without that 67 tour. I think over time, when you have that bonding experience, there's nothing like it really. And some days were a little difficult because you'd be tired and cranky, but we all in it together and we just had so much fun. And to this day, when we've had Luther reunions, the people I wanna see the most are the choir members because we, we have kept pretty close over the years. You know, we all had little groups of people, but still the choir as a whole was a, it was a marvelous thing to be able to be part of that and to relate to each other in a very comfortable way. Luther College took a chance when they decided to send Nordic Choir to Europe, and the gamble paid off. Weston Noble saw his dreams fulfilled as his choir transformed from a group of inexperienced Midwestern kids into citizens of the world. Elwyn Farwell succeeded in enhancing Luther's reputation, both nationally and internationally. The choir members had the musical adventure of a lifetime. During those six weeks, they traveled by air, land, and sea, enjoying the luxury of the Lufthansa aircraft while grinning and bearing the close quarters of the Bronx Seven. They experienced the hospitality of host families and relatives as well as the suspicion of the East Germans. They witnessed the lingering shadows of World War II and the shocking reality of the Cold War. They learned how to navigate in foreign countries and find their way back when they got lost. They shared their music in airport lounges and in the sanctuaries of ancient cathedrals. Though their memories may vary, each member of the 1967 Nordic Choir European Tour will always recall the music, the laughter, and the conductor who had the ability and commitment to make them the very best musicians and people they could possibly be.
This is fun.